disclaimer number one. This is the hardest introduction I've ever had to write in my whole life. Disclaimer number two, I'm very nervous. <laughs> First and foremost, I would like to thank you, Dean Noria, for all of your support and your patience in the coming together of this conference. We would not have never done it without you. Just to put things in perspective for the audience, we caused in the past week so much trouble to HBS that if I want to uh, someday have a shot at getting to Harvard Business School, I'll probably have to change my hair and apply under a different name. <laughs> but on a more serious note, it's an immense honor to have you moderating this final panel. Could you guys hear me? Yeah. Cool. Dean Oria is one of the world's leading intellectuals in leadership and human motivation. He has served as the dean of this phenomenal school since 2010 and has contributed to make it more global and more diverse. Mas agora em português, que hoje eu tô patriota. <risos> eu queria agradecer também as verdadeiras estrelas dessa conferência, que é o time da organização. Vocês foram nos últimos meses o melhor time, os maiores guerreiros e os melhores amigos que qualquer um poderia poderia ter. Finalmente, se o Brasil conseguiu parar as duas universidades mais poderosas do mundo por um fim de semana, é porque alguém chegou um dia para a gente e falou que sonha grande, sonha pequeno, dá o mesmo trabalho. E é para essa pessoa que a gente dedica esse painel final. O Jorge Paulo é mais conhecido por ter trazido para o Brasil a medalha de ouro em eficiência e gestão. E por ter trazido a eterna satisfação de chegar para o nosso amigo americano, que está tomando uma Budweiser, e falar Did you know that that's on the Brazilians? Estou <risos> brincando. O orgulho é brasileiro, mas o sucesso é global. Mas eu diria que seu maior legado tem sido a formação e o apoio a uma geração que se preocupa hoje um pouquinho menos em ganhar em dólar e um pouquinho mais em fazer alguma coisa substancial para o nosso Brasil. Eu não quero exagerar, Jorge Paulo, porque a gente sabe que você odeia homenagem, mas eu não poderia de deixar de dizer que eu nunca conheci alguém com um poder tão grande para inspirar e transformar a vida das pessoas. For this final introduction, for Jorge Paulo Lehman, and one month before some of my friends and I graduate and leave Harvard, we could not find good enough words to make justice to what these past years and to what you, Jorge Paulo, have meant to us. So Professor Shapiro once said, if you don't know how to end a story, just make the building catch on fire. So here's to surpassing expectations. Here's to listening to the higher calling of serving better our country and our kind. Here's to the power of ideas and to eternal gratitude. Here's to you, Jorge Paulo. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Warren Buffett. <laughs> What a surprise. <laughs> you need some water also? <laughs> <laughs> Good to see you, Warren. Okay. Good to see you. I'm going to give you one of each of these. I've got to get away from these cameras. Nobody wants me in the picture. <laughs> okay, we should get started. So look, if, they, if there was ever an example of Jachinho, this is it, right? I mean, how, how, how much more could you conspire to create <laughs> the most remarkable surprise for someone? So uh, thank you, Warren, for coming to this uh, amazing much. event. Thank you, Giorgio Paolo, for who you are, for these students, uh, for all that you've done for so many at Harvard, uh, and for what a wonderful man you are, that you're able to bring with you friends from all parts of the world, uh, and especially uh, 
It just tells you how special you are that Warren would come uh, for this event as well. So, you know, I've always felt that when I was growing up, my nickname was Little. Uh, I was a small guy, uh, and so I feel particularly little today in the presence of, uh, <laughs> of two giants. Uh, just think about it, you know, one of uh, two of the greatest investors, uh, people who have done so much in business, uh, who have done so much philanthropically. Uh, so I, my only goal at the end of this is to just say the least, let them say the most, uh, and allow you to have uh, the opportunity to ask questions of them as well. But let me just start because uh, the two of you have had uh, wonderful partners through, the, through all of your lives. Uh, you know, Charlie I, Munger, I've had the opportunity. Before you start, can I add to Dean Noria's bi biography? <laughs> <laughs> okay. You know, I think most of you came here and you think you're going to have a, the conservative dean of the Harvard Business School asking me questions, me, uh, an entrepreneur that takes risks and that sort of thing. And that's not really true, and I'm going to explain why. Last year, uh, I went to Warren's annual meeting, and and Dean Noria came also. He was, a, he was a guest there. And so we, we decided we would go to di dinner together, and a dinner that Warren was giving. So we, we were exiting the hotel, and another good friend of us came up and said, I have, a, I have a Ferrari here, and would you guys like to drive it? So the Ferrari was going, <laughs> I was terrified. <laughs> But Dean Ori immediately said, I'll take it. <laughs> so, and he got in, into the Ferrari. He didn't even know how to put on the lights. <laughs> off, off he took. And we, we tried to follow him. We, we couldn't follow him. We didn't know. But he did get to Warren's dinner anyway. But so this is the real Dean Noria. Not, uh, a risk taker. A risk taker. <laughs> See, what Giorgio Paolo didn't tell me is the opportunity to drive a Ferrari is something that he can get every day. <laughs> <laughs> For me, this was the one time it was ever going to happen. <laughs> so I better take that opportunity when you get it. So, uh, so look, you know, again, uh, it's, it's such a true privilege to have both of you here. And uh, I had the great privilege because of your invitation to get the opportunity to see Warren and Charlie uh, regale a room full of 60,000 people and... Uh, you could just tell that these were the dearest of friends. They had been business partners for all of their lives, and uh, they could finish each other's sentences. Their jokes were remarkably common. And I've had the same experience with you. I've seen you with your partners. I've seen you with Beto and Marcel. And uh, you know, your company is called 3G. You're called by everybody else, the Three Musketeers. I mean, this is, these are remarkable friendships, uh, remarkable friendships that have endured, that have allowed you to build great businesses. And now, late in your lives, the two of you have decided to kind of hook up and do things together. Uh, tell me, what was it? What's that late in your life come from? <laughs> <laughs> Early in your life. There's a lot of life in both of you. I know that for sure. I'm, I'm <laughs> so uh, how did the two of you decide that uh, this partnership was something that you were going to form and start to work with each other? Or well, maybe you should start and then I'll let Giorgio Paolo follow as well. Go ahead. Well, we met. Uh, you're not working. I don't know how to work anything in these days. Uh, uh, it's working. <laughs> it's working. Okay. Yeah, here's my flip phone, incidentally. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I was on the board of Gillette, and uh, I'm not sure exactly what year it was. Hang on. No, I don't think it's working. Yeah. Now it should be. Okay. Is it working now? Yeah, it's working now. Yeah, yeah. Testing one billion, two billion, three billion. <laughs> After all I'm talking at Harvard, I mean. <laughs> and we liked each other, but we didn't get much of a chance to talk at, at these meetings. I, at, uh, they were fairly well scripted in terms of time. Uh, and I consider it one of the larger mistakes in my life that we didn't really team up uh, as partners till uh, considerably later, but uh, um, he and I are, we're on the same wavelength. <laughs> and uh, we were out in, in Colorado 
I don't know exactly how, four years ago or thereabouts, and 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 uh, as we went to go to the plane to leave, uh, Georgie Paulo brought up Heinz, and and he sent me, and I said, "Sounds good to me." And uh, uh, a little later, he sent one page of financial terms and one page of governance terms, and and just as would have been the case if I was doing something with my partner Charlie Munger. You know, basically, I didn't have to change a word. I mean, he's, you know, it, who you have as partners in life, and you start with most cases with your spouses. But in terms of, it, it, it's a lot more fun, and it actually is a lot more profitable to have wonderful partners. But the most important thing is, it, it's just a lot more fun in life. And we've had a good time. We'll always have a good time together, and that applies with my partner Charlie, and it, it applies with my partner Georgie Paulo. Well, uh, I met Warren at the Gillette board, and many of you have heard this story, but it's, it's significant, so I will repeat it again. And we were, he was asking me, I, at that point I was selling the bank, and he was asking me if I was happy that I was selling the bank, and I said I was happy. And then he asked me, why, why was I happy? And I said, well, because... Uh, I really didn't want to be somebody running a Goldman Sachs or say I'd much rather be like him. And he said, why is that? And I said, well, you, you have better control of your time, you have a better sense of humor, and you're much, rich, much richer. <laughs> so, 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 so he said, uh, well, I'm going to show you how rich I am. And, and then I didn't know exactly what he would do, but he brought out this little agenda, you know, and he leafed through it. And there was nothing written in it. And so he said, look at how rich I am. I, have, I don't have much to do. I only do what I like, and I only do it with my friends. So, you know, so I'm very, very rich. So my wife complains till this day. How come you, you don't have so much time as Warren? I mean, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, the two, the two things you can't buy are time and love. You know, and they're two, the most important things, obviously, in the world. But, uh, but then on... Uh, on the, you know, the Heinz deal, we knew each other already, and uh, we sent him a, uh, a, a memorandum, et cetera, a short, short memorandum. I called him up, and, and I said, well, Warren, are you interested? He said, yeah, I'm interested. I said, okay, would you like us to come by and, and explain in greater detail the transaction? And he said, how much money do you need? And I said, 14 billion. And he said, okay. <laughs> so <laughs> I, so that, that's sort of a... Uh, shook me up, and, and then I said, how about governance? And he said, well, send me a memo, and if it's okay, it's okay, and so that's it. So he, you get answers from him right away. They're very clear, and they're very objective, so. Oh, what a wonderful, ex what a wonderful partnership. So I, I thought, you know, even though this gets us to the present, I, I might start this conversation by asking you both to uh, remember back, and uh, I've heard from writings about both of you how important your fathers were to both of you, and, uh, but maybe you could share something th about your formative years. What were some of the most important formative influences before you got to the age of at least some of the people in this room? So uh, in, the, in your growing up, what ended up being the most important influences in your life? Well, I had a father I worshipped, and he never disappointed me. And if the people that you love never let you down, you're going to have a wonderful life. And I was lucky in that I found out what I liked to do very early on. And that was, that was really accidental to quite a degree. And uh, I always tell students to look for the job uh, to have if you didn't need to have a job. And I found that really when I was maybe seven or eight years old. And so I was lucky in that respect. But I, my dad was my teacher and my best friend. And uh, if you've got some heroes in life, I've had maybe a dozen heroes, uh, and it, it, you go through life and they never let you down, uh, you're going to feel very good about life. And, and it won't be how much, how much money you have. I mean, I've never met anybody uh, whose kids love them when they're 65 or 70 that felt like a failure in any way, you know, that whether they were rich or whether they were living on a modest pension. And I was lucky enough... Uh, have a father like that, and then, uh, for various reasons which I won't get into in detail, 
Uh, I was kind of a mess uh, <laughs> for a few years. Well, not, for, uh, not quite that long, but in any event, uh, it carried forward. And then uh, I married a woman who, who really uh, uh, just helped me become less lopsided in life. And so it, it, I, I've been lucky at a very few crucial times, and I've had a wonderful partner in Charlie Munger. I met in 1959. We've never had an argument. Uh, so if, you, if you're lucky, and I always advise people to hang out with people better than you are, because you're going to go in the direction of the people you hang out with, and there's nobody you're going to hang out with much more than your spouse. So it's very important to, to marry somebody that's better than you are, which in my case wasn't very difficult. <laughs> but uh, and that's, that's what for me, it, it, you know, the IQ isn't that important. I mean, it's, it, you've got to you've be intelligent, but, but you know, it, you don't have to, you, know, you don't need 170 IQ or anything like that to succeed in life. What you, what you need to do is, is develop the talents you do have, find the places where uh, those talents leave you the happiest and, and produce the best results in a market society. And, and enjoy life as you go along. I mean, you, you don't want to say I'm doing this and that and this and that until, you know, I'm, at 70 I'm going to finally have a perfect resume and finally find something I like. I always say that's a little like saving up sex for your old age. You know, I mean, really, <laughs> it's, you know, it's, it's not, not the greatest plan in the world. So uh, it's been simple, you know, just come on, find the right father in my case, as in my case, find the right spouse and, uh, and then find a job you love, and good things are going to happen. George Apollo? Uh, well, in my case, the dominant figure was my mother. My lost my father when I was 13, so she was the, the dominant figure, and she, she, she loved me very much, and I could do anything, and she thought it was, <laughs> she thought it was okay. And uh, you know, when I was here at Harvard, and I almost got expelled the first year, and so I received a letter from the, uh, from the administration suggesting that I take a year off because, and she was absolutely furious and wrote back a letter saying that her son was a genius actually and I don't know what. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good mother. <laughs> so, so I had a mother who was, uh, I didn't take the year off, I came back and, but anyway, so that was, that was my mother and she was. She was really important, and it took me a little while to get going. Uh, I graduated when I was 20, then I played tennis for a while, finally got into business, went broke in the first attempt, uh, learned a lot, learned a lot. So uh, by the time I got going, I was 30, and, and then, it, then it was pretty good. And I sort of found my way. So, you know, if you if you dropped out, you might have created a place so I could have gotten in. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> I've been trying now for 19 from 86, 67 years. I mean, <laughs> well, uh, you know, should have left a slot open for me. <laughs> I had a, I had an uncle, I had an uncle, an uncle who lived in the U.S. And after I got out, and after I started doing well, he kept saying, "See what I, see what I did for you by keeping you at Harvard and like that." And I said, "What do you mean? You cost me a couple of billions. Look at Bill Gates." I mean. <laughs> 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 Bill at least got in. I didn't even get in. <laughs> that was the greatest mistake Harvard ever made, by the way. <laughs> so, uh, you know, the, one of the things that I have personally been fascinated about is, is leadership. And uh, it's a complicated word. Uh, there are as many definitions of leadership as there are people. And people have tried to decipher what leadership is for a long time. How do you think about leadership? W what is your definition of leadership? Well, I've... I've been friends with some great leaders. And, uh, Tom Murphy, who's still on our board, for example, is, a, I mean, he is, if, if he says follow me, we just all line up. I mean, you know that, uh, you know you're going in the right direction. You may not be able to see over the hill, but you know that Murph can. And uh, uh, he was a class of 49 at the business school here. Uh, they're, they're, the, they're the ones that you yeah, have not, only confidence in their judgment, and, and that they can see over the next hill, uh, even if you can't. And but but also, uh, you know, they know you know they've got your interest at heart, and, uh, as, and it's not all about self advancement themselves. But uh, I've seen, you know, a, a few really 
wonderful leaders. I'd probably start with, with, with Tom Murphy. This is my number one <laughs> example. Uh, I've never known anybody that had anything to do with him, and I've known him 45 or plus years, that if the phone rang and he said, it's Murph, and, and uh, here's what we're going to go out to do that wouldn't say I'm on board. You know? and, uh, uh, and incidentally, I mean, Georgie Apollo is a sensational leader that way. I mean, if, if, if the phone rings and it's Georgie Apollo on the other end, I'm glad, that, I'm glad it's ringing, you know, and, and I am ready to listen uh, when he says, how about, what do you think about Heinz? And, you know, my question was whether it be friendly, but uh, once there's a yes to that, I mean, you know, I'm ready to march. Uh, and Don Keel was a great leader, a fellow that ran Coca-Cola for many years. That uh, Jeff Bezos is a sensational leader. Uh, you know them when you see them. They, they, they're very different in personality and style somewhat, but they, they have that common quality that, that you believe in the fact that they can see where you're not able to see it. And, you know, you get it into military command and all that sort of thing when you have a D-Day, but you get it in business uh, when other people are skeptical of your ideas and, uh, and, and, and somebody comes along like a Murph and uh, you know he's going to get you. You know, if, if you out on a mission together, you know you're gonna come back, it's that simple. Hmm. George Apollo? Oh, uh, well the way I, I look at leadership is you, to lead, you, you have to point a direction, and in my case it's usually a big dream of some sort that everybody can understand, and you, you have to have the right people to do it with, I mean, it's, it's hard to be a leader by yourself. You know, Warren has all these people in his companies that he trusts. And, and uh, basically, I have all these people that have trained with us or have been brought up with us somehow or another and like that. I think you have to have a, have a lot of focus. If you, if, you, if you don't focus, if you try to do too many things, it doesn't work. And I think you have to have a... Uh, be efficient also. In anything you do, there's efficient ways to do it and there's a way that's not so efficient. So you always have to try to be effic as efficient and as rational as possible. Uh, keep the cost down and like that. And I think involved in leadership is, uh, is taking a little bit of risk also, like, uh, like you took with the Ferrari. I mean, you know, you, you got to... You got to risk. Will not insure you. <laughs> you have Ward to has a slightly different view of risk, I think. <laughs> and uh, so that's that's basically the way the way I look at at leadership. And is there a particular leader that has uh, you know like Warren talks about Tom Murphy, who is uh, you know an example of a great leader? Has there been someone in particular who uh, who has been a role model or an example yeah, for you? In, in the early days, we were we had a retail company in Brazil, Lojas Americanas, and so we became friends with with uh, Sam Walton, and so we visited him uh, a lot, and we, we used to live with him at his house, and we used to visit stores with him and like that. So we obviously picked up a lot from his style of of management and the way he ran the company, and like that. So he he was very important. And uh, for a while, we didn't really know him, but we followed very closely what GE was doing and how they were managing people and how they were picking the best people and uh, how they had targets for everything and measured everything and like that. So those were some of the things we followed. We, we were also very close to Goldman Sachs in the, in the beginning, when Goldman Sachs was still a partnership. And so we learned from them the, the partnership spirit and and the importance of having a lot of good trainees and picking good trainees and, and a meritocracy really which made these trainees evolve like that. So those were some of the things that had a big influence. And lately, you know, Warren, Warren, we, his good common sense and his analytical skills when, you, when you're looking at something or like that are, are incredible. And so we've learned a lot from him. I should have mentioned Jack Welch too. Yep. I, uh, uh, Jack was an incredible yeah. leader, uh, and and I would say one characteristic of the leaders that stood out to me is they have big ideas. I mean, that, that doesn't mean that they 
they're, they're dreamers totally, but they, 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 they always have got a big idea, and they may be taking steps to get there or anything, but they don't settle cheap. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, each of you have had this great ability to pick remarkable people whom you can trust. Uh, in your case, Georgia Powell, sometimes uh, very young people with very little experience. In some sense, someone might almost say untested people to whom you give responsibilities of running you know, multi-billion dollar businesses. What gives you that sense that this is the person to bet on? Well, most of these people, we haven't just hired them where they've come from. You know, most of them have, they may be very young, but they've been around for a couple of years already, and they were being tested, and gradually, that's our system really of training and uh, evaluating people, uh, give people an opportunity where they can make a mistake or, or not, or they can prove themselves. So most of these people have been, have been around. And but how do you know that uh, they're ready yeah, for the uh, really big one? Uh, well, you know, w Warren and I both <laughs> agree that what we really like is fanatics in a certain way. You know, guys who are going to go out and really, really try hard, and they really they want to do that well, and they want to do it exceptionally well. I think that is the main, the main characteristic, you know. And, uh, but there are different types of people. Some people are good for this, some people are good for that. You, you sort of have to pick what people are, are good at. And, you know, the only thing you cannot accept is somebody that is ethically not totally there. So you have to test that. I mean, people can be different, but, you know, not ethically. Eth there's, you can't, you can't do, do with that at all in an organization, because then it all falls apart. So. Warren? Yeah, well, I've always said we have a one-line employment uh, form, and it just says, are you a fanatic? You know, and, and <laughs> the answer to that, yes, you know, just hand it in. And, uh, I, I want people that are in love with the business. You know, I, I'm in love with Berkshire. I mean, I, it, I will never, I've never sold a share of Berkshire. I never will. It'll all go to some other place. I mean, it's 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 not money. It, it's uh, it's just I'm in love with the company. And, and if Berkshire is doing well, uh, I'm feeling good. And and there's no way I can feel good if if Berkshire did not do well. And so I want people that that we've got a fellow Tony Nicely that runs Geico. He he went to work for the company was in when he was 18. He's now 73. And and when we talk, I mean he's. If, if they've had a good week the previous week in terms of, of of closure ratios or whatever, he'll know it out to a decimal you know decimal points and and he's he's proud and and I you know it's his kid I mean, and I I love it when we find people like that and uh, uh, often Berkshire's the most uh, uh, you know it is the most uh, decentralized place you've ever seen in terms of the management and I buy these businesses where I hand somebody a billions of dollars and then count on them to run the business after they've got the money and I've got the stock certificate. Uh, and and we're, I'm not always right. I mean, I, I'll make some mistakes on that. But I really have to look into people's eyes when I hand them a lot of money sometimes for businesses and s ask myself, do they love the money or do they love the business? Now, they all like money, but they've got to like, they've got to love the business. They're going to keep working for me after I hand them billions of dollars. You know, at uh, because we don't use contracts, uh, uh, I find people are in love with their businesses. And, and, uh, and that deepens with people as they go along. I mean, once they've, you know, I had a woman that couldn't read or write that came to this country and put, finally put $2,500 into a business and became the largest home furnishing store in the country. And, uh, and I, she worked till she was 103. And then when she quit, she died the next year, which I use as an example to any of our managers. And think about, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, she she till the day she died. I mean, she would look at the sales figures at the end of the day, and that determined how she felt. But, uh, and those kind of people, you find them, and uh, and then you've got to be sure that they want to go in the same direction you want to go, and you make some mistakes on that. That's the one thing I probably improved on over the years is is judging the future behavior of, of people I encounter. Everything else goes downhill. I mean, but, uh, but that 
that you do get some experience helps on that, and it's enormously important, and particularly at Berkshire, where we just hand them the keys to the place. Mm -hmm. And you but too have found that you can spot it early? Or you too have found that you can spot it quite early oh, in a person? Almost instantly, hmm. yeah. Now, I, I, I can tell, uh, I can tell within a few minutes, usually, whether we're going to make a deal or not, you know, and, and whether I'm going to be willing to. Uh, and I, I make mistakes on it, but, uh, but there's a lot of fill. It can go through about 15 filters in the first couple of minutes, and I don't like to look rude with people, but I mean, the, the answer. You've made a decision. I, I, I know the answer, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's a, what, what have you found out about management and, and, and that maybe applies to us or that we can learn from you in your. <laughs> so look, I, 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 General Schwarzkopf once, uh, I heard him talk at, the, uh, at West Point, and he made a very simple point. He says, you know, leaders are people of competence and character. They've got to be people who you, whose judgment you trust because there's something about their competence. But in the end, you have to, judge, you have to trust them for their character as well. And it, I just found those two simple things, uh, competence and character, to be one of the most important ways of thinking about leadership. It's quite simple. And I think, as you said, you know, those are the people when, if you pick up the phone, you're happy that they're called and uh, you're willing to listen to them. Uh, so it's not, uh, I do think that this is a field that people make more complex than it needs to be. There's actually something quite simple about leadership and it's having the, the judgment that other people will trust and then the integrity that people know that they can do business with you for a long, long, long time and uh, you'll never fail them. So, uh, I, and you two are masters of that. I, I just think that, you know, we are in the business always. Uh, one of the reasons why I asked about young people is that every year we admit uh, 900 people to Harvard Business School and we admit, you know, 1,700 people to the college or 2,000 people to the college. And you always wonder uh, who among them will be the next George Apollo Lehman or who among them will be the next. And I'll be honest, uh, even though I've taught for 30 years, I can't tell. Well, and the one thing, it won't be the person with the highest IQ. Or, yeah, for uh, sure. No, I mean, that we know. No, no. no it, it, I, I always, when the schools come out to see me and there's a bunch of students out there, I say, you know, I'm going to give you an hour and I want you to pick the person that you, you'll uh, own 10% of for the rest of their life. And, uh, and then, and why? And list the qualities. And it won't be, you won't be looking for the guy with the highest grades or, the, 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 you know, uh, it, 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 it just write the qualities down, and then I say, and they always like this better. You've got to sell short one of your com uh, one of your uh, classmates also for ten percent. Now that's way more fun. They <laughs> <laughs> now they look around. Yeah, if and, that happened, uh -oh. and I ask them what are those qualities, and the truth is, the qualities they admire, they can acquire. They're smart enough. I don't have any problem about that. And and the the things that turn them off. Uh, they can get rid of those qualities in themselves. I mean, if, if, if it turns you off in somebody else, you're going to be turning off people if you have those same qualities yourself. And it, those are things, those are habits and behavioral patterns that you can actually, young people particularly, can, can, uh, can uh, adjust to. And why in the world wouldn't you want to have the qualities of the one that you'd want to buy 10% of? And why in the world would you keep any of the qualities of the one you want to short 10% of? And, and the time to start is now. Yeah. So, uh, each of you have been, are very selective in the businesses that you buy. Certainly, Warren, you've written a lot about the kinds of businesses you like. Uh, maybe just since there are a lot of people in the room who some of may have heard about that, some of them may not have, what is it that you look for in a business? And Georgia Palo, I'll ask you the same question. What is it that you look in a business that you want to acquire and, as in your case, you own them for a long, long time? Well, the first thing I want is a business I can understand. And by understand, I mean I think I know in a general way where it'll be 10 or 15 or 20 years from now. And I have to decide whether there is some economic castle that's surrounded by an economic, uh, by a moat that has a lot of sharks and piranha and things like that. And, and then I have to decide whether the night in the castle is going to be any good when the marauders come across. Because in capitalism, that's exactly what they do when they see a castle. So it's not a very... Not very complicated. So the first decision is, does this fit within my circle of competence? And there's a lot of businesses I don't think I can see out 10 or 15 or 20 years on. And then there's some I can. And then uh, when I get beyond that, you know, I have the question. I, I, I care a lot about that moat. And, and, and uh, uh, you know. And what are the yeah. characteristics of a good moat? Well, the ideal moat, you know, <laughs> obviously, uh, is, is something that would be protected 
from any competition. But yep. usually, usually earnings are regulated in businesses like that. But, uh, but the idea, you know, perfect perfect product is something that costs a penny and sells for a dollar and is habit forming. You know, basically. That's Coca Cola <laughs> right here. Yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> I mean, that was in 1886. You know, uh, some guy named John Pemberton down in pharmacy in, in Atlanta hit the wrong spigot or something, and it came out, and every year, pretty much since then, sales have increased around the world. So that, and and uh, it's to come, come along and say, I've got, I've got a cola that, well, just, just take the number of candy bars. Snickers happens to be the number one candy bar, and you don't buy candy bars very often, but if you walk into a 7-Eleven or someplace, and the Snickers is... 60 cents and the guy says well I got this other candy bar that I my wife and I mix up in the back room and it only sells for 45 cents and it's as good as Snickers you say I'll still buy Snickers and if they don't have Snickers and there's a 7-Eleven across the street and you really want it you'll walk across the street and the products you want are the ones you'll walk across the street for and have some price flexibility in and 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 have a ubiquity to demand Coca-Cola travels sees candy which we own does not travel we can make all kinds of money in California but if we try to move it East, we were in Bloomingdale's, different places. It doesn't, it doesn't travel. Candy bars don't travel very well. I mean, Cadbury doesn't do very well here, and Hershey doesn't do very well. Coca-Cola travels. It's, it's universal. And so uh, uh, there's different qualities you're looking at, but basically you're trying to find something where you think you've got a very high probability about being right about predicting the earning power out 5, 10, and 20 years, and that, that does depend on competitive positions. You don't want to depend too much on great management. I mean, if a business needs great management, you know, it probably isn't much of a business. I, I really like a business, I, I, ideally, that, you know, that, that your, you know, your idiot nephew can run and then put in a good manager and do way better. <laughs> and then put a great person and then it'll do well, even that's better. What, yeah, yeah. That's what Tom Murphy did. I mean, you know, he, he, he just he left Harvard here and he just he, he looked for a good business. And, and he'd be the first to tell you Absolutely. that, you know, if he'd gone to the textile business, which we were in and stayed in it, it would have been, you know, there's nothing you can do. And uh, so it's, it's very important to get into business that one way or another you have some pricing flexibility, that, you, that one way or another the competition is under control at least, and then, and then turn a terrific manager loose in it and, and uh, you know, then just sit back and cash the checks. Send it to Alma, that's the important thing. <laughs> <I tell. laughs> uh, we We've come from a slightly different background. We started in, in Brazil. There wasn't the, the option to pick amongst various businesses to buy. Basically, so you know, we don't, we don't have that many businesses. We have a few businesses, and we sort of picked one which we thought looked very, very good, which is the beer company, and, and really focused on it. And all along the way, building up these management teams, which we, we now have. And, and then the beer company went abroad. And from there, we, we found out that we, we could buy things abroad also. So we did Heinz together, Warren, like that. So it's been slightly different. So we're, we have fewer businesses. And we're probably more focused, because we didn't have that option in the beginning to pick amongst various businesses to buy. And, and when we bought them in Brazil, we had to run them because they were usually badly run. So, so I think our skill sets there are a little, a little bit different. But in the end, we're running things for the long run and to build them to last forever, if possible. So it seems to me that one of the ways in which Warren has often bought businesses are great businesses where there's some market decline, like what happened in 2008 eight to Goldman Sachs, you go in and you say, here's a great business. It doesn't deserve to be devalued by what it was. Uh, this is a good time for me to come in and help. And you've done this many times in your life. In your case, you seem to buy businesses that seem to be fat, dumb, and happy that have been run for a long period of time, where you believe that, at least in the near term, we can go out and make them much more efficient. But both of you hold on to these businesses for long periods of time. So a lot of people think that the 3G formula is to come in and just cut. But You've run some businesses after that initial phase for very, very long periods of time. What happens after the first opportunities for, you know, like once you've taken the fat out of Heinz or of Anheuser-Busch or any one of these things that you first go in and uh, do and it gets all the headlines, but you run these companies for long periods of time, Giorgio Palo. What's the secret after the first cut? Oh, uh, the secret ha has been after the first cut, you buy something similar 
<laughs> There's a lot of such businesses out there. You cut there, and uh, well, in the case of beer, there's you've done not, this three, four times now. Yeah, there's not that much more. Uh, if you're doing what we have been doing, you're obviously not quite as good as you should be in marketing or developing new products. So we're catching up there, but we're going to get good at it. Uh, you know, uh, if you focus on something. Uh, we're going to get good at that also. So that's, that's what it is. In the, in the, the food area, there's, there's a lot to be done still. I mean, you know, that, that can, can probably be bigger than the beer area, possibly. And, uh, but we do have to, uh, the world is changing. Uh, there's a lot of disruption going on. Consumers are forever more fickle. There are new ways of distribution. You know, Amazon's coming in. Uh, so we have, to, we have to adjust, and we have to be ready for the changes. We have to be much more nimble in terms of giving what the consumer really wants and what he wants to buy. And uh, so that, that is a change. And the only way we will be able to do that is by having the right people. So we're very focused on finding the right people for what it's going to take to run these consumer good companies in the long run. So I, you know, you're from Brazil. Uh, you're from clearly a great American. You've always said there's no better country than America uh, in terms of a country to invest in. You know, we've had 240 years. It's a remarkable country in terms of what it's accomplished. You know, and then in the last uh, 20 years or so, there's been this great excitement about emerging markets. They started off as uh, the BRICS. Uh, I mean, the, in some ways, the bloom is off the whole emerging market thing a little bit. Uh, but one would argue that in some other parts of the world, people are also anxious about, uh, about America. I mean, I, I remember as someone who came to this country, I walked around the world, and people used to always envy the fact that uh, I had this great opportunity to come to this country. Now you don't feel sometimes the same level of uh, envy again. Uh, I, like you, believe that it's misguided. I think that this is a great country. And, but how would you think about uh, the future of these emerging markets? Uh, because if you think about the fundamentals, at some level one would argue that with demography, with growth, there should be enormous possibilities. So how do you think about the opportunities in America versus uh, the opportunity in uh, some of these emerging markets? And maybe we should just get rid of the R and just focus on the BIC because I'm not betting on, on the R part of the BRIC. Well, to move a, a market cap of $400 billion, you know, we're not going to do it in some small economy. That doesn't mean that the businesses we have shouldn't look for opportunities to extend their own operations in those. So, uh, but, but uh, America, you know, is a wonderful place uh, to live and, uh, and, to, uh, and to invest uh, capital, and there may be other countries that are, that are going to be somewhat better, but from s so much lower base that it, it wouldn't move the needle much at Berkshire. It'll move it for some of our subsidiaries. I'm delighted. You know, I got a letter from a fellow in Israel uh, 10 years ago or so, and he says, you know, you don't know who I am and you don't know who my company is, but, or anything about my company, but here are a few facts, and we, we want to sell to Berkshire, and we only want to sell to Berkshire, and if you're interested, I'll come over. So we bought a company in Israel now. Uh, and it's done very well for us. But it's, uh, if we're going to prospect, uh, we're gonna, this is where, you know, this is a huge, huge, huge market. And, and if there's something modestly better that where I don't understand the culture that well, or the, the laws, or, the, uh, uh, or just have an acquaintance with the business people, and we're missing, that doesn't bother me at all. I mean, it, it, uh, uh, I, I, I think America's a pretty darn good, good place to invest in. If I get a call from Germany tomorrow or the UK or someplace and they've got a $5 billion or $8 billion or $10 billion deal for us, I'll be delighted you know, to try and make a deal. Uh, but I don't want to get a call on a $200 million. I mean, uh, uh, we just can't, it's not going to move the needle. George Apollo? Oh. Uh, America's a wonderful place. I mean, you know, this business of uh, letting people in, foreigners in, and, and uh, the free market, the technology that's coming along. The, it, it's, 
the rule of law here. It's, it's wonderful compared to the rest of the world. I mean. But oh, there are opportunities abroad. And in our case, uh, beer is a, uh, not a growing market in Europe or, or the US anymore. So we have, to look, we have to look at other places. And we have to go to even an extreme where, like we've done now, where we've gone into Africa in a big way. I mean, we uh, uh, took on a lot of debt That's to buy deep. SAB. And basically, the big attraction there is Africa, which now has a billion people, which will have two billion people in 30 years' time. Hot climate, young population, uh, the ideal market for us in beer. We have to learn how to operate in Africa. But you know, the, the potential is there. And uh, yeah, Africa, maybe 30 years from now, will be much bigger than the US in terms of beer consumption and all like that. Oh, so one last question, which has been on so many people's mind. And clearly, this election and the rise of nationalism in so many parts of the world has raised this question. On the one hand, there's no doubt that if uh, you know, I'm dean of Harvard Business School, so I'll, I'll show my stripes fully. Uh, I deeply believe in free trade. I mean, there's nothing more powerful than free trade as a way to create, and you have said this many, many times, that uh, society as a whole and the world as a whole is always better off with free trade. But as you have yourself said, uh, Warren, uh, it doesn't mean that the steel worker in Pittsburgh or the textile worker in Burlington ends up benefiting always from free trade. There are specific people who get hurt, and it looks like these Specific people are now raising their hand ever more loudly in every part of the world and saying, uh, if you don't listen to me, I'm going to stop free trade. Or at least I'm going to push very hard to stop free trade. How do we manage this tension? It feels like one of the most important tensions for the world to manage because in an odd way, if they were successful, they'll just hurt themselves even more. That's at least how it feels to me. You, you need the leaders in countries and particularly the leaders in the United States. The, the, the President of the United States should always be the educator-in-chief. And uh, uh, the truth about free trade is that it, it benefits 320 million plus people in a way that they really can't see and, predict, and never think about and it's not itemized on the check, on the, on the uh, slip uh, when they pay, out, uh, pay, pay at the register at Walmart or anything of the sort. So it's diffused, it's unrecognized, and uh, Nobody goes to, night, to sleep at night thinking how much better they're living because we have free trade. And, uh, uh, and on the other hand, the, the people it hurts, and it does hurt people, uh, it's very specific and they, they know what happened to them and, and they don't feel it's fair that it happened to them and I happen to agree with them. But, but that doesn't mean you stop free trade, it means you have, you have policies that in a very, very, very rich society with almost closing on $60,000 of GDP per capita, that you take care of the people that get hurt by, having, by this policy which benefits everybody generally. And, uh, and you can talk about retraining and all of that, but when we took over Berkshire and New Bedford, not very far from here, it had 2,000 workers and 1,000 of them spoke only Portuguese. And they'd spent 25 years on looms and they weren't going to find other jobs. So you have to take care. And if you don't take care of the people who are specifically hurt by that, you can't blame them for voting to anybody that promises them that they'll end their pain. So I, if you've got something that's benefit to all of society and it's gonna hurt a few individuals, part of a wise administration of government policy is to make sure you take care of the people who are gonna be hurt specifically because in a democracy otherwise they will, they'll get organized and uh, I, I've got every sympathy in the world for the steel worker but you do not want to give up free trade. Just postulate two kinds of worlds. You know, one where the United States is isolated by itself and is doing fine and much of the rest of the world is, is suffering because of nationalist policies we have. And then, or one where everybody is improving and the emerging countries, and poor countries are growing faster in GDP per capita than, than the United States. Well, you want the second world. I mean, particularly when people have nuclear weapons around. Now, you do not want a lot of jealous countries around the world that have nuclear weapons or, or, or cyber capabilities or whatever it may be. So I, I just think, I think it's very important that the leader of the United States 
gets very candid and can deliver a message to people and says, you know, this is going to hurt a lot of people who don't deserve to be hurt if we're importing shoes or whatever it may be. And uh, if you are at an age where it's sensible to retrain and all that, fine, but if it isn't, we're going to have some sort of credit, essentially, that takes care of you because you're, you're contributing to society by screwing up, uh, screwing up your life. And uh, we can afford to do it. That's, that's the amazing thing. I mean, you know, we are an abundant, abundant country. We have six times the real GDP per capita that we had when I was born in 1930. You know, six for one in one person's lifetime. And we started from a reasonable base. I mean, this, we have abundance coming out of our ears, but we can't have a situation where the Forbes 400 had eight, 93 billion of aggregate net worth in 1982 when they started it, and now they have 2.4 trillion. 25 for one. Top guy on the list was Dan Ludwig with two billion, who I've never ever heard of. Well, the rewards in a specialized society, market society, uh, have, go have gone and will go dis disproportionately more to the people who, who are at the top of the game and, and people get left behind, but we can take care of that. We can have earned income tax credits like we have and make that system a lot better and not give up the benefits of the free trade and the market system, which causes the guys like Jeff Bezos and Steve Jobs and all those to do things that work wonders for millions of Americans. Thank you. George um, I'm all in favor of free, free trade and globalization. I think if you look back in history, countries that have engaged in commerce have, you know, have benefited enormously. Uh, they've learned a lot from whoever it is. They've They've become more efficient. So uh, I think this current trend of stopping trade or like that is something temporary. I think with the internet, you know, the world is becoming closer and closer. And I think there's no other way that we can go uh, but, uh, than have free trade and globalization on a, on a big scale. I think it's good for the world and, you know, and it, it will happen. So. This is a matter in which we clearly all three are deeply, deeply aligned. So I'm, uh, listen, it's, uh, I, I think that, I don't know what, do we have time to have a few questions? I, I, or are I we need pretty one much minute out for something at the end. Okay. Whatever. So no time for questions, right, Larissa? I, I would like to, free trade essentially is a market system for the world. I mean, yep. we, all, we believe in what the market system's produced and it's just a world extension of, of a market system. It, it, it seems so obvious to me, but, but it, I, it's also obvious that people should not have their lives ruined by the fact that something... And we should be able to... Um, oh, real true. leadership should be able to do both, right? And, and, and we can't... But you have, to, you have to explain it, though, first. I mean, yeah. the, 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 when Roosevelt came in and said, you know, we're going, to, we're going to close the banks because a lot of them are no good, and, you know, and we'll sort this out and open up the good banks in a couple of weeks. Well, a couple of weeks later, he comes out and says, you know, these banks are okay to open. Well, Roosevelt didn't know a debit from a credit. I mean, he didn't know which banks were good or anything. But the American public was getting, they believed in him. And, and, and the system to work had to get the banking system working again. I, I think you really need somebody in the White House that, that will explain to the American people what's good and bad about certain economic developments and, and promise them that the government is on the side of doing the thing that's right for society and on the side of the people that get hurt by it. Thank you. Uh, so I think we have, uh, we're, we started late, we're running late. We have time for maybe one or two questions. Uh, that gentleman there seems to be leaping out of his feet. So, <laughs> so <laughs> and then you and then we're done. Professor Amartya Sen says that there is one thing in common between Adam Smith and Karl Marx, and this is the, the f freedom of people going everywhere. And today, since you are talking about the importance of free trade, globalization, how is it possible for the U.S the president of the U.S. too, thinking of building a wall separating the United States from all Latin America. I believe that the important thing will be 
for us to have not only freedom for capital, goods and services to go everywhere, but mainly the most important thing that is the human being. Freedom for the human beings to go everywhere. This must be our objective. I would appreciate your opinion on a, about this. Yes, we get it, sir. Objective. <laughs> about this wall. Uh, I certainly live here, sir, as a, as a living example of uh, someone who's benefited personally from the freedoms this country has always had to allow immigrants to come in. Uh, Warren, you, re you wrote something about this very eloquently recently, so maybe you should say a word. So you will certainly get no issue from us yeah. uh, on this matter. Well, when I was born in 1930, the odds were roughly 40 to 1 against me being born in the United States. So I, I won what I call the ovarian lottery uh, the day I was born. And it, it was, you know, just, it was dumb luck, but, uh, uh, you know, I have had, I've had a chance uh, uh, to really ride the crest of something. Just imagine, in 1930, John D. Rockefeller Sr. was the richest man in the world. Everybody in my neighborhood, and it's, it's not a fancy neighborhood, and the median income is probably 100000 a year. Uh, the mean's a little higher for those of you who are mathematically inclined. <laughs> but, the, uh, but everybody in my neighborhood lives better than John D. Rockefeller in terms of medicine, in terms of transportation, in terms of entertainment. You get up and down the line, and that's happened in one person's lifetime. Now, when you've got a tailwind like that in your life, you know, you should feel very, very lucky. Yeah. And we should create that opportunity for all. So, uh, last question here. Okay. Thank you, Jesu, for being here. Uh, it was mentioned in uh, one of the panels uh, yesterday. Oh, sorry. Hi. Uh, it was mentioned in one of the panels yesterday that, like, five or ten years ago, the most valuable, uh, five most valuable companies in the world used to be like Exxon, Shell, and Walmart. And nowadays, these are numbers of 2016. The five most valuable companies are Facebook, Google, Apple, Amazon, and Microsoft, which are all tech, tech companies. So how do you choose to see that in terms of investment in the future? Thank you. Jorge Paulo? Oh. I'll have what he's having. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm obviously aware, aware of the value that Facebook and Google and these new companies have, have achieved, and I'm actually envious of them. I mean, you know, it's... Uh, and, uh, but the businesses that were available for where I was and where I started, in Brazil, where basically uh, beer and more simple businesses and like that, and trying to grow them as much as possible. And I'm not, Warren, Warren has avoided doing what he doesn't know or technology or like that. And I'm, I'm tempted to give it a try <laughs> at times. And uh, you know, I have some ideas, some way that I could give it a try without risking too much or like that. So I'm conscious of what's going on. I think it will continue. I mean, you know, I think the, the better investments will be in technology. The problem is technology is very difficult to pick, and things change very fast there. But I still think uh, that these companies, which are now the most highly capitalized, will, will continue around for some time. And there will be other opportunities. And I would like to know a little bit more about it. Yeah, if you take Apple and Facebook, Microsoft, Google, Alphabet, uh, in aggregate, just those four will have uh, well over $2 trillion of market value. They require no net tangible assets. So they, uh, the business, you know, and those, they're wonderful, but here's, here's Apple, you know, will earning 40 or so billion plus after tax. And, you know, with 3 billion of inventory, no 
no fixed assets really required. They've just finished a big building. Uh, uh, no receivables to speak of. Uh, it, it takes no capital. That's a different world than when Andrew Carnegie got rich and John D. Rucker. I mean, they had to build one steel mill, take the profits from that over time, build another steel mill, maybe borrow some money. But uh, the world where you can translate an economic model into something that's worth hundreds and hundreds of billions approaching a trillion of value with no tangible assets, you know, is that's a different economic model that even, you know, if we go back to 19, 60 when the number one company would have been General Motors and down the list. Uh, and you can now get, there are, there are businesses which don't require much inventory, they don't require fixed assets, they don't require receivables, and, uh, and they get extraordinary margins. And that is a different investment world. That doesn't mean both kinds of businesses can't exist, but well, we, you know, our candy business takes no capital. You know, our, our gift certificates take care of the capital needs of the business. And when you get businesses that, now it's a peanut business, but, but it, 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 those are extraordinary economic opportunities. I don't think they existed to this, well, they didn't exist remotely to the same degree 50 or 60 years ago when more was tied to physical assets. And that makes a very different investment world. So I, I want to uh, be respectful of everybody else's time. It, I, we could go on forever. This is such a remarkable treat. I want to thank uh, Larissa. I want to thank all of the organizers of this conference to have given us this uh, amazing opportunity to get to do this. But I know that you wanted to have the last word. And since this is your conference, this is your last word. Oh, my God. <laughs> So I, I, uh, I just want to take the opportunity to congratulate the students who put this together. It's been a, a wonderful event. And for me, it has filled my, my heart with joy to see the, the, uh, the, the high potential agglomeration of, of people here. You know, like I said, most of my businesses have been people-oriented or based on people. And that's what Brazil needs at the moment, needs good people. And so to see so many of you working together and ready for dialogue to make Brazil more meritocratic, more pragmatic, a more equal society, and like that, you know, fills me with uh, a lot of optimism for the future. And maybe we will even be able to reach the 4% growth per annum in the next decade that Ahmenu promised us yesterday. I mean, it was the ex-central banker. So congratulations to you all. And what a team this is. And you can transform Brazil. And, you know, and I'm, I'm looking forward to that very much. Thank you, ladies. <laughs>